Irfan Gafar joins us after uh, sitting in with Jeff on rink-wide following a 6-3 loss to the Vegas Golden Knights. And uh, Irf, we'll start with our poll question. Are you worried about the Canucks? <laughs> I saw I saw when you guys tweeted that out, and both of you uh, were yes answers. So mm-hmm. I'm going to have to agree with you both. But not a yes, I'm worried about the team as a whole. I, I think it's more so their recent form, you know. They beat up on teams like the Buffaloes, the Calgarys, and the, and the they didn't even beat up on the Anaheim Ducks, to be completely honest. But when you lose games like you did against the LA Kings, against the Dallas Stars, and then we here in the media, everyone was building up the game against the Vegas Golden Knights as you know a potential first round opponent. That's the big bad Golden Knights. It's who the Vancouver Canucks want in the first round. Eh, not entirely sure that they want them in the first round, judging by that performance. Look, they're going to get their goalie back. They're probably going to get Elias Lindholm back before the playoffs, but power play, not good. Secondary scoring, not good. Elias Pettersson, not good of late. Those are all signs pointing towards, I'm kind of worried about this team a little bit heading down the stretch. Yeah, their last win against the playoff team was March 9th against yeah. Winnipeg, where they destroyed Winnipeg. Since then, you're quite right. They've plucked off the uh, non-playoff teams. They've gotten victories there. They have lost to the teams that are in playoff position, Colorado, Washington, or Washington's right on the yeah, right on fringe that. there, LA, Dallas. And often I say, you know what, those those wins can still be used as traction so that you can mm-hmm. then beat the better team, but that hasn't happened. Hasn't. They, they haven't used those games. They didn't use the traction of the Ducks win to help them beat the Golden Knights. Mm-hmm. No, and I've said this before, like, we're going to, Elias Pettersson is a focal point around this team. He gets the big money, he gets the big contract, you know, and then, He's kind of tailed off. And you look at the superstars yesterday. Jeff and I alluded to it on rink wide. The superstars of the Vegas Golden Knights, Jack Eichel rifles off seven to eight shots a game, has 10, 11 attempts. Jonathan Marceau shoots the puck like crazy. William Carlson does that too. JT Miller had a couple of shots yesterday. Brock Besser won. Elias Pettersson, just two shots. Like, and, and they're not even shots that you remember. So unless he's playing through something, which may be the case, it's just very interesting to me to have this player who the Canucks have invested so much into down the stretch completely disappear a little bit. And, and Earth, two shots against Vegas, one against yeah. Anaheim, four against Dallas, okay, one against LA, four straight pointless games, five of the last six of pointless, didn't have a shot against Montreal. I mean, you're quite right. Um, what do you think? Do you think he is playing through something? I mean, I think at this point of the year, everyone is playing through something, but the maintenance day before the game against Anaheim, there was question if he was going to play and then he did end up playing. But then you just mentioned one shot. Was he really effective in that game? I mean, you can beat up against the Buffalo Sabres all you want, but against the big, bad Golden Knights, against the LA Kings, against potential opponents, really, you kind of haven't been there a little bit. So it's something that, you know, the coach has been very picky and careful about where he chooses where he's going to name a player in post-game media scrums or he's going to call it a player he's been saying for post-game a lot lately that guys need to step up he needs to see more from certain players he won't name them but you can bet that he means number 40 and and you can bet that if it was a player down the lineup he probably would have named him yeah and and usually when coaches go anonymous it's the guys that they can't really hang out to dry in the media um, or have hung out to dry recently and don't want to pile do it on. again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You got to pick your, pick your spots there. So um, maybe he's playing through something. Every, you know, there's a lot of maintenance days being doled out. Are those maintenance days just to rest guys up? Or do you think there's some guys that actually have kind of injuries here that they're legitimately playing through? Yeah. I think when you look at the defense, obviously, you know, Zadorov had the game off and they're going to say the rotation type of thing. I don't think that he's battling through anything, but Philip Ronick is an interesting one. You know, he's all playing almost every single game this season for the Vancouver Canucks. And he's a guy that, you know, could be battling through something. I, I, I just wonder what's going on there. I'm not entirely sure if it's upper body or lower body, but that's one to keep an eye on as well. If he gets a maintenance day here down down the stretch run here in these last handful of games. Um, and as far as guys, other than that, like, I mean, you have Noah Juleson's probably coming back into the lineup, but beyond that, like Mark Friedman's their extra defenseman. So if one of these guys goes down or, or, or needs a break. You better give it to them now before you head into the first round, before you head into game one. Uh, Lindholm, uh, what is a wrist with Lindholm? At this yes. 
Sounds like wrist, hand area. You know, I think on the broadcast on Hockey Night in Canada, they they did show that. And, you know, he had his hand taped in that area. So it's something that, you know, he's obviously on the trip. He is skating, you know, with his teammates uh, before the main group does go out. So that's a positive sign. If he wasn't on this trip, I would be worried. Um, but I, I think it's just about him is just, you know, getting him healthy for, for game one of the playoffs. So probably wants to get into one at least two games before they head into the postseason, but I'm not 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 too too worried about him. Who what looks about like- Demko? Uh, what are you hearing? What what do you think the plan is with Demko? So Demko, if you look at it based on just a numbers thing, so on the ice against the before the Vegas Golden Knights, you know, without really his teammates, probably on the ice this morning in um, Arizona. Full day off is what I guess will be a team team day off on Thursday. First full practice with the team on Friday. I'm not entirely sure if they're going to be comfortable putting him into that game on Saturday against the LA Kings after only one practice. Maybe they practice on Sunday and then another morning skate and then maybe Monday against the Vegas Golden Knights here at home where you can get into your routine and things like that. So I I do think that Demko will play before Lindholm, but we'll have to wait and see what what they decide to do. A lot of frustration from the captain in the postgame last night. Um, And he looked like a guy who legitimately wanted to make a difference. He's certainly not part of the group we just talked about from Rick Tockett. Um, But he's in a pretty small group of guys that are making themselves feel, you know, known in a game. JT Miller, I think, is another one. But beyond that, I mean, how many other guys are saying, I'm trying to be a part of the solution here? It seems like it's a pretty small group. Yeah, Quinn Hughes was the only player that dragged them back into the fight yesterday, to be completely honest. I mean, and that was very evident. Had two goals, 15 on the year, which is an incredible season for him. But, you know, more often than not, it is Hughes. And it is a guy like JT Miller. The question is, is where's Brock Besser kind of been? He's been having an incredible season. You know, he's probably going to get to 40 goals this year. But I know he scored the other night. Um, or the other afternoon against Anaheim. But again, it's it's been slow. And I know Brock Besser scores in bunches or scores three or four a game. And, you know, we, we talk about him t- to that effect, but he's kind of been pretty quiet. So if he's quiet, if Pedersen's quiet, you know, you have guys like JT Miller who are one of their most consistent forwards who's there every single night. Guys, they have one guy with 10 goals since the All-Star break. And that's JT Miller with 14. Their next highest is Niels Hoaglander with nine. So just by that, you look at it and say, where are the where's all the, these other guys who were lighting up the league so early on in the season? Andre Kuzmenko also has nine. Yeah. Uh, he yes. scores nice goals, too. Indeed, he does. Uh, do you think they should have uh, had an early hook on DeSmith and brought him back tonight against Arizona? Were you looking at that when the, the first period was getting away from them? A little bit. Jeff and I looked at each other and, and, and then thought that there, there might have been a little bit of it. But I think the plan was you were going to get, you know, Seelovs in net against the Arizona Coyotes. And it got away from them so fast that maybe Rick Tockett looked down and talked to the coaching staff and said it just wasn't fair to put Seelovs in net and him, you know, get absolutely ventilated against Vegas just by the way that they were rolling. So unfortunately, you got to leave DeSmith in and kind of hang him out to dry. You know, he, he's probably going to want at least one or two of those back. First goal, for sure. You got to cover the puck. The Marsha so won. Yeah, I went through to, to Zadorov, but, you know, maybe the positioning was a little off there. Um, and he's going to say he wants more than that back. But I mean, he didn't get any run support, to be completely honest. And you have to hope that Seelaws gets that today against an Arizona team who can score some goals. Yeah. Tough night for Ian Cole. Are yeah. you starting to think that Noah Jolson is one of their best six, particularly as a natural righty? Let me ask you guys. Th- yeah. Let me ask you guys this. If you're looking at that Canucks defense, I don't think that Ian Cole is one of the six best defensemen to play game one that gives them a chance to win i I'm really starting, don't yeah I, i'm with you there i'm starting to feel that i i didn't think that in the past now i wonder if you're better off playing Jolson on the right side of the third pair the the natural righty and look you know you're probably going to have to play cole at some point if you last long enough in the playoffs and he's a veteran that i might feel more comfortable about dropping in after a layoff than Joel we see these curiosities guys come playoff time every single year. And again, Canucks fans are out of practice with this, but guys that play 80 to 82 games in the regular season 
and then aren't the choice in game number one of the playoffs. It happens all the time across um, the National Hockey League, and you get that sample size to make the decision of who's ready to go in game number one. And, yeah, we might be at the point where – Juleson's first pass to might be that much better uh, to get the Canucks moving in the right direction. Maybe that's the way to go. I think it, it might be might be opponent dependent, but that was the big heavy team where you would have thought Ian Cole was the better choice over over Noah Juleson, and it didn't seem to be the case. Yeah, I mean, Zadorov obviously being out of the lineup doesn't help. Ian Cole has to play more, and you go into the playoffs, you know, Quinn Hughes is going to eat minutes. Him and Philip Ronick are going to end up playing 26, 27, yep. 28 minutes a night probably, so... Having said that, I mean, you put a guy like Juleson in, you know, on that third pairing, you can protect him a little bit by not having to play him as much if you don't trust him too, too much. But like what I'm seeing from Ian Cole, like the maintenance days, obviously he's a little bit older as well. He does have the experience, but the experience unfortunately didn't show the other night when he was on the ice for five goals against. When you were in here last week, we were talking about Dakota Joshua potentially resigning him. AFP Analytics looking at him as a three by three million dollar player. Uh, then he goes scores two goals against Anaheim, including the winner and the beautiful between the legs goal. Uh, what's your sense? Does Joshua make himself even more money after looking as good as he has looked coming back off the injury? Well, it's funny. People in this market were ready to hand him a blank check after that Anaheim game, right? I mean, it's just, I mean, it's just the way that this market works in some in, in some cases. But look, I think the Canucks have to be smart about this. I mean, you know, they offer a contract to Philip Ronick, so that their offer is out there. Their next, you know, business is Dakota Joshua. I think Teddy Bluger, they kind of know where they're going to be at. If I'm Dakota Joshua, I'm looking at it. I'm 27 years old. This is going to be my contract. This is the NHL contract for me. I've done enough. It, uh, this season to probably earn myself at least $3 million a season. Some team is probably going to pay him north of that. I'm not entirely sure if the Canucks should do it. The potential to be a 25 goal scorer. Okay, sure. If he does ride shotgun with JT Miller for the rest of, you know, his potential career here in Vancouver. Another question is, does he believe in what they have going here? Does a first round exit early exit does a second round exit did, did things like that change or does he want to test the your unrestricted free agency waters and see what it's like and feel what it's like to be wanted um by a number of teams because you definitely know there are going to be some teams that will be willing to pay top dollar for his services it's just a matter if the canucks are the team that he wants to stay with yeah he uh was pushing and shoving there in yeah. one of those skirmishes last night i i was mm -hmm hoping he was not going well, to drop the gloves and thank no exactly uh no but here's the thing i think it's become readily apparent that the vancouver canucks aren't going anywhere far when you've got three maybe four wingers going on any given night like joshua garland hoaglander is not enough besser has to be on form and then you need another guy or two uh from the other four wingers that you're gonna play hey let me ask you this uh Pod Colson, 13 games, two points. Baines, eight games, zero points. Even going back earlier in the season, uh, Linus Carlson, four games, no points. So you have called up three AHL wingers who all have had uh, pretty good years yeah. down there. We're deserving of the call-ups. It was a meritocracy. And you've got 25 games out of them and two assists from Vasily Pod Colson. Why not try Ratu or Sasson, one of the, one of the centermen at this point? They're both going. In the AHL, could you see a hail mary like that? Earth, call up one of those guys, see if they can be the spark, even if it's out of position on the wing. Yeah, I don't. Uh, scoring. I just don't think that this late in the season. I think they know what I think they know, and they're comfortable with what they have. Um, I'm going to be completely honest. Like, I don't think RG Baines is going to be on on this team come game one of the playoffs. To be, you know, I, I think that's very evident. You know, they've got guys like Phil DiGiuseppe and Niels Amon that they'll plug in. I mean, he had a really tough night the other night. Kind of looked out of place against Vegas. Um, but silly put Colson's an interesting one because he's not getting elevated into the lineup. Like RG Baines gets to play with JT Miller. Vasily Podkolson doesn't. He's kind of being stapled to that bottom six forward group. Now he hits everything that moves and he's playing that type of physical role, but I'd be interested to see if they decide him to move, if they decide to move him up into the lineup I'd into a more too. offensive role. I think yeah. that's an interesting one for me, but those other guys, Matt, to answer your question, it, it's probably a Hail Mary. I don't think that they do it, especially if you're bringing a centerman up to play on the wing at the NHL level. I just think that right now they need to get their top six forwards going 
before they even worry about bringing other guys into this lineup. But, but what is it about the shots, guys? Why aren't these guys shooting? Like I, I don't cool. buy. I don't buy that it is injury related. I think injury related. Who, who are we talking about and, on the shots? Like like everybody. Like like nobody's shooting right now. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. Uh, is the system as defensively uh, well, Blake, great as the system is? Is it preventing these guys from getting into shooting like locations? They they have been one of the worst teams in the league all year on shots on goal. Yeah, this you're absolutely right. When you play the chip and chase, dump and chase system, you're just not going to have possession as often to be able to create that volume of shots. Yeah, you, and I you think- need puck retrieval. Right, that's a core of what they do. They need puck retrieval, and when the puck retrieval isn't there, it's going to have an impact on the number of shots you're able to direct a goal. Yeah, I mean, down being down as many as they were against the Vegas Golden Knights, Tyler Myers can't be leading your team in shots after 40 minutes of play, and that was the case against Vegas mm-hmm. with the Canucks. And another thing on the power play, like you know, there's so much with it that has potential for success. It's had success. Connor Garland. When they pass him the puck, the fake one-timer, nobody's falling for that. I'm sorry. No one in the National Hockey League is falling for that. They're going to give him that shot every single day of the week. So what you have to do in order to change your power play is you need to get Elias Pettersson moving. You need to get him into a position where he can open up and shoot the puck. Because other he skates uh, behind the net with yeah, the puck. How about exactly. somebody re- resets and gets people wondering what the hell's that about? They just set up and they don't move and they do the same thing over and over again. Well, another thing, Matt, you and I discussed it all last week, right? The book's there on the Vancouver Canucks. They know exactly what the power play is. It usually runs through JT Miller. He touches the puck every single time. So you take away that pass. You have to be more creative. Like you just mentioned, Blake, I'd like to see Quinn Hughes behind the net with the puck, right? And and just doing more. Get people chasing. I, I Yeah. Well, and, and here's the thing. They've got three power play goals in the last two games, and yet still we're criticizing it, and that's because of the totality of what we have seen since the All-Star Blind squirrel break. finding nuts doesn't uh, cure the problem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Earth, great stuff. Thank you for this. We'll catch up soon. All right, gentlemen, be well. Hey, everybody. If you're enjoying what you're seeing here, then follow along with Sakaris and Price on YouTube. I promise more content coming. They call it, the kids call it subscribe on YouTube. Well, how about liking it? Do that as well. Smash it right now.